Hello everyone. Let's analyze. So we've mentioned the term closed intervals and open intervals before and we all understood what we meant even though we actually haven't given a precise de definition of what do we mean by open and closed. Given a set or a subset of the row line what does it mean when we say that it's open or that it's closed? And if open and closed is a property, a subsecond half, how is that property and other properties preserved, lost, or warped by continuous or possibly uniformly continuous mappings? In fact, this is actually the central question of the field of topology. Of course, it's also of importance to applied mathematicians who are interested in knowing when, for example, convergence properties are preserved. Uh, since their bread and butter is approximating oftentimes intricate mathematical models using discretizations. And the idea is that these discretizations will converge to exact solutions in some limit, typically in the limit as the fineness of the discretization approaches zero. And if I have one model and I continuously warp it to another model, is this property of convergence maintained? All right, so let's approach this viewpoint by first giving a precise definition of what we mean by an open and closed set of real numbers and how they're related to each other. So a subset of the reals is closed if and only if every accumulation point of the set belongs to that set. So the set contains all of its accumulation points. A set is open if and only if every entry of the set, there's a neighborhood of that entry also contained in the set. Okay, so we now know what we mean by closed and open. Uh, Let's take a break and think some deep thoughts. Can we show that the closed interval a to b is in fact closed according to the definition given? Can you show that the open interval a to b is in fact open according to the definition of given? Well, of course you could. Oh, and by the way, you should. That would actually be a very good exercise. Is a set without any accumulation points closed? That's deep, right? A set's closed if it contains all of its accumulation points. Well, what if it doesn't have any? So, think about that. Psst. Yeah, yeah, you. Listen, don't tell anyone I told you, but the answer here is yes, since the definition would actually be vacuously true. By the way, this would be a good time to press pause and look up the term vacuously true if it's a term you're not familiar with. Now, could you imagine a set of real numbers that's neither open nor closed? Can you think of a set of real numbers that is both open and closed? <clears throat> Well, I'll let you ponder these deep thoughts, and we'll continue forward. A subset E of the real line is closed if and only if its complement is open. Let's prove the statement. Well, let's begin with the forward implications. Okay, in other words, assume closed, prove complement is open. All right, so what do we know? Okay, we know E is closed. In other words, every accumulation point of E is contained in E. Now, what's our goal? Our goal is to show that the complement of E is open. <coughs> that is, if X is a real number not in E, there exists a neighborhood of X also not contained in E. Okay, so... Given what we know, let's start to work towards our goal. 
Suppose x is a real number in the complement of e. In other words, not an e. Okay, we know e contains all of its accumulation points, so x is not an accumulation point of e. Which means not every neighborhood of x contains infinitely many points. In other words, there is a neighborhood of x that contains only a finite number of points of E. Well, there's a shortest distance between X and those finite number of entries of E. Let's call that closest entry, closest distance delta. And let's cut delta in two. Well then, the half delta neighborhood of X, remember delta is the shortest distance from X to its nearest neighbor or its nearest um, element of E in the neighborhood. So if delta is the shortest distance, half a delta, right, is shorter than that, which means the delta over two neighborhood of X contains no entry of E. And if the delta over two neighborhood of X contains no entry of E, then it's contained in the complement of E. And well, since X was an arbitrary element in the complement of E, and there's an open neighborhood of X contained in the complement, we've met our goal. Okay, let's tackle the reverse implication. What do we know? We know the complement is open. In other words, if X is a real number, not an E, then there's a neighborhood of X not contained in E. So we know that. What is our goal? Our goal is to show E is closed. In other words, show E contains every accumulation point of it. So given what we know, let's work toward our goal. Let X be an accumulation point of E. Right? Remember, my goal is just to show that X is an E. OK. By definition of the term accumulation point, every neighborhood of X contains an infinite number of elements of E which means there is no neighborhood of X without element of E. So there does not exist a neighborhood of X contained in the complement of E, because every neighborhood of X has an element of E. Now, remember the complement of E is open. So every element of it has a neighborhood around it contained in the complement of E. Therefore, X is not one of those entries. And if X is not in the complement of E, it must be an E. And well, that's exactly our goal. X is an arbitrary accumulation point of E, must be contained in E. Q E D. Now recall one of the questions you were asked to think deeply about. Is there a set that is both open and closed? I won't tell you. Okay, fine, I'll tell you. The answer is yes. That's a little bit disappointing, isn't it? Because we tend to consider these properties as mutually exclusive, but that's not true. Well, could we fix it? Could we come up with a stronger idea of closedness that would be mutually exclusive to openness? Well, we could, we could consider a set of something more than closed if it's both closed and bounded. If it's closed and bounded, then it can't be open. What kind of special properties would such a set have? And in what ways could we describe it or quantify it? And from the topological perspective, perhaps the most important question, how would continuous and uniformly continuous functions deform it? Well, I'm glad you asked. We're going to define this property as compactness. And while we could just say that a set is compact if it is closed and bounded, which, by the way, that's true, We, we're going to prove that compactness is equivalent to closed and boundedness by way of a theorem rather than as a definition, but it is an equivalent definition. 
So, what is the definition of compactness? Well, there's actually going to be two different ways that we think about it. Okay, and both ways are equivalent, and we're going to prove that that's true. So, in the first way that we define compactness, and by the way, this definition is usually referred to as sequential compactness. In the first way, we're going to define compactness in terms of sequences. Why? Well, because we're interested in convergence. And also, we have so much machinery that we can apply and use for sequences. So let's give the first definition. And the second definition we'll give in the next lecture. So, definition of compactness, take one. A set E is compact if every sequence of numbers in E has a subsequence that converges to a point in E. So let's review a couple of examples. Um, let's consider the set of all real numbers. Of course, it's closed. The set of all real numbers has all of its accumulation point. But it's not compact. Think, for example, the sequence of natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so forth. All right? That's a sequence of numbers in R, but there's no convergent subsequence. So it's not compact. OK, let's consider the closed interval A to B. Well, every sequence of numbers in the closed interval A to B either has a finite number of different values, meaning one can create a subsequence of the same number infinite times, or there's an infinite number of different values. And in that case, if I have a sub if I have a sequence of entries between A and B with infinitely many different entries, then by Boson of Weierstrass, the set of values has an accumulation point. And since it has an accumulation point, the value is contained in the closed interval A to B because, well, it's closed. Furthermore, because it has an accumulation point, there is a subsequence of that sequence that converges to it. How do you know that? Well, you proved it. If you don't believe me, go see homework 7, problem 1. You proved it. And by the way, if you didn't, come see me and let's get to the bottom of it. Okay, now, I say that we could also define a set as compact if it's closed and bounded. And we're going to prove now that that's true. That the definition given is equivalent to the property of closed and bounded. So let's prove it. We'll first prove the forward E is compact, therefore it is closed and bounded. Okay, so what do we know? Okay, we know E is compact, which means... We know that every sequence of entries of E has a convergent subsequence with the limit value in E. Okay, what's our goal? Our goal is to show that E is closed. That is, if X is an arbitrary accumulation point of E, then X is in E. And to show that E is bounded. Well, let x be an accumulation point of E. All right, if we can show x is any, then we've shown the closed property. OK. There exists a sequence of entries of E converging to x. We know that that's true because x is an accumulation point of E. There's infinitely many points in any neighborhood of x. So I can construct a sequence of entries of E that converges to x. In fact, it's proven in theorem 1.17 of the textbook. But in case you're a little fuzzy on that theorem, by the way, you should go take a look at that theorem in your textbook. You should press pause right now and do that. But just as a reminder, you can generate this sequence by just choosing xn to be an element of E contained in the 1 over n neighborhood of x. As n goes into infinity, the neighborhood shrinks in size, and xn is arbitrarily close to x. OK. so. The sequence xn converges to x, so we know that every subsequence uh, must also converge to x. In fact, we proved this theorem in the notes 
uh, when we introduce the concept of subsequences. Now, since E is compact, then an X is a limit of a subsequence of elements of X, then X is contained in E. Okay. So we've shown that compact implies closed. Next, we need to show that compact implies boundedness. And in order to do that, we're going to use the, or we're going to prove the contrapositive. That is, not bounded implies not compact. Of course, you remember the concept of contrapositive. If it was a universal law that every time I entered the party, the song Return of the Mac played. If the song Return of the Mac did not play, then I did not enter the party. So if compact implies bounded, if something's not bounded, that would imply not compact. And to prove that's true is equivalent to proving what we want to prove, that compact implies bounded. Okay, let's begin. Now remember, we're going to show not bounded implies not compact. So we're going to assume that E is not bounded. In other words, for every natural number, there is a value of E whose absolute value is greater than it. All right, now what's our goal? Show that E is not compact. In other words, show there's a sequence of E with no convergent subsequence. <clears throat> so, for all natural numbers, there's an element of E, let's call it Xn, and it's an E that satisfies that its absolute value is greater than n. In other words, Xn is bigger than n, or negative Xn is smaller than negative n. So for every number L, and we're thinking of L as a possible limit, right? for every possible limit of some subsequence, of course we're going to show that no number L could be a limit of a subsequence, but right for every candidate limit L, then there's a natural number greater than the absolute value of L. And for every n bigger than that natural number big N, 0 is less than n minus absolute value of L. But that's true because n is bigger than the absolute value of L. And since little n is greater than big N, or greater than or equal to, uh, this is bounded above by little n minus the absolute value of L. Oh, and by the way, the absolute value of xn is bigger than n, so it's bounded above by the absolute value of xn minus the absolute value of L. Now, remember that this is greater than 0, so it equals its absolute value, right? positive number, so it's equal to its absolute value. And now we can actually use the reverse triangle inequality. Therefore, for infinitely many values of my sequence xn, I cannot be arbitrarily close to L because the distance of xn to L is bounded below by, well, a positive number. Right? If epsilon's smaller than this number, I can't be less than epsilon for infinitely many n. Therefore, there's no subsequence that can also be as close to L for infinitely, infinitely many n, so there's no subsequence that converges to L, and L is an arbitrary number. And we've proven our case. I just built a sequence in E, and there's no subsequence that converges. Therefore, E is not compact. If I assume not bounded, then it has to be that E is not compact. Meaning that if E is compact, E must be bounded. Okay, now let's re prove the reverse direction. In other words, suppose that E is closed and bounded. Let's prove that E is compact. All right, so what do we know? We know E is closed. That is, it contains all of its accumulation points, and we know it's bounded. 
Now our goal is to show that E is compact. In other words, if Xn is an arbitrary sequence of values in E, then it must have a subsequence that converges to a value L in E. Okay, all right, so let Xn be some arbitrary sequence of values in E. Now, this sequence of values is bounded. Therefore, it has a convergent subsequence. You don't believe me? Well, see homework seven, problem two. And the limit of this convergent subsequence is, well, let's say L. Right, now, by the way, if xk equals L for some value of k, then, well, L is an E, and we've proven our case. In other words, that the limit of the convergent subsequence is an E. But if not, if xn never equals L, then for all epsilon greater than zero, there's infinitely many subsequence values within an epsilon neighborhood of L. That means L is an accumulation point. And since E contains all of its accumulation points because it's closed, L is in E. Therefore, the limit of the convergent subsequence is contained in E, and E is compact. QED. Well, that's it for today.